Okay, today is Tuesday, September 17, 2013. This is Forensic Interview of Children. We're in our second week now. We had our first week here on campus, and last week what I did was I, I went over the Blackboard pages for you and tried to explain the interface to you, you know, where you click, how you get around, what the assignment structure looks like, what, where to find out where your grading rubric is, those kinds of things. We really did talk about anything substantive last week. Today we're going to get into um, a little bit of the substantive material for this course. And like I said last week, this first section, which is a two-week learning unit, we are in our second week, um, you know, this is an overview. Uh, it's an introduction to what we'll be talking about throughout the semester. Uh, so uh, much of what I talk about today uh, will feel like jumping around a little bit. You'll um, be introduced to some of the subject matter, and then we'll look at it in greater detail later in the course, okay? I'm going to um, go over just a bit the two chapters in Professor Fowler's book that you were responsible for today, as well as um, you know, the article about how forensic interviews can go astray. Uh, that was one of the two uh, readings that you had to do that were non-textbook readings. They were PDF files. Uh, the other one was about the historical perspectives of children's suggestibility. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that except to say that although in the area of forensic interviewing of children, there wasn't a lot of research about the impact of bad questioning on children's memories of past events up until 1979, there was some research on the impact of suggestibility in a general way. The impact of suggestibility on adults, the impact of suggestibility in context other than forensic, that is, legal proceedings, and upon subjects other than children. And that's what that article was, a, was about. It took you back hundreds of years at times and talked about different kinds of studies on suggestibility. Although there were a couple of studies around 1900 or so where they looked at murder cases um, and the impact of suggestibility in the context of murder cases. That was as close to forensics as that prior research got. Nevertheless, there was research on how questions, how behavior might influence people's memory specifically kids, but people's memory. You may remember one of the um, experiments was about, you know, whether someone uh, smelled a particular scent in the room. They sprayed, I don't remember the flavors, but assume, uh, you know, the scent of an orange from a spray bottle, and they suggested it smelled like blueberries, and a certain amount of subjects thought it smelled like blueberries, when in fact it was oranges. And, you know, they looked at the, the potential for people to have their uh, beliefs influenced by the suggestibility of others. Um, so there was that kind of research uh, out there, uh, but not much, if any, on the impact of questioning on children's memories. That begins about 1979 in the 20th century. Two areas, though, that we need to put current philosophy on forensic inter interviewing in historical perspective are uh, a friend I introduced to you last week, Franz Mesmer. He's mentioned in that article. And in a moment, uh, we're going to address uh, the Salem witch trials of the late 17th century. Those are two historical uh, moments in time where the impact of suggestibility was front and center to most of the population in France and to most of the population in colonial America. Now, Franz Mesmer became a, a, a rock star, if you will. I mean, he was going all around France uh, curing people of their ailments. Whatever bothered them, he made many people feel a lot better after he entered their lives with his uh, flowing robes and his staff and the moons and stars uh, that were patterned on his uh, attire. And he uh, 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 was becoming so popular and so well-known that the government began to get a little scared. So who's this guy going around 
uh, curing people, anybody who's able to do magical things is a threat to the government, right? So they said, let's investigate this guy. They weren't too afraid, but still he was uh, gathering uh, a lot of uh, followers and they impaneled a commission to look at exactly what it was that Franz Mesmer, Mesmer was doing uh, to these people. Was he in fact healing them? Or was he a charlatan and a fraud? Was he someone who was duping people out of their money? Or was he someone who was sincere and helping them get cured from whatever ailed them? And at the end of the commission's uh, work, uh, they concluded uh, in large part that uh, Mesmer, uh, you know, whether he was a charlatan or not, whether he was out to steal their money or not, they concluded that people genuinely felt better, some of them. And they would attest that Mesmer made them feel better. Um, but he didn't have any uh, special skills. He wasn't magic in the least bit. Uh, he wasn't uh, adjusting their animal magnetism. That's how he characterized it. He was coming, he would adjust their animal magnetism, uh, that somehow their magnetism was not in equilibrium. You know, I was watching the Sunday night football game or the Monday night football game, and he was one of the coaches on one of the teams, one of the assistant coaches, and he had one of these wristbands on with um, some kind of magnet in it. You know, which is a sham. Uh, has no more credibility than Franz Mesmer, these silly things that people buy and put on their wrists. I was surprised that a professional football coach, but you know what? They have more superstitions uh, than the rest of us, I guess, when it comes to you know, winning and losing in sports. But Mesmer was another character, perhaps the father of the modern magnetic wristband, um, who uh, the French government, after their commission evaluated it, concluded that there was no magnetism being readjusted, not in the least bit. Because that doesn't make sense, it's not scientific, it's not real. But what happened was he was influencing people's feelings about their illnesses, about their state of wellness, by being suggestive, by sending positive suggestions to them. And it made them feel better. We know today, and perhaps they knew a little bit back then, but we know today that a lot of illness and the breadth of the illness, how serious the illness is, and how, how deeply the pain and discomfort is experienced by the person is influenced by stress and psychology and how they feel about themselves. Now, stress can exasperate true illness, and it can bring on a feeling of illness upon people who are not in fact ill. That doesn't mean they don't feel sick, and they don't feel pain, and they don't feel discomfort. Um, uh, but many times that discomfort uh, is um, you know, the product of high stress um, and feeling ill, and in fact some people are not. And people who are truly ill, we know s with certainty uh, that stress and psychology and a lack of proper nutrition, a lack of caring about yourself, and a lack of feeling good about yourself can make you feel worse. Far worse. So it's no surprise then that Franz Mesmer comes in and, and adjust people's magnetism and tells them that they feel better and um, uh, is very positive in his approach that people in fact felt better. Right? When I was out in Columbus, Ohio a few months ago, I met um, Nanook. Nanook was a beautiful uh, retriever dog and Nanook's role was to make kids feel better. Okay. He was a service dog, but his role was to make kids feel better about disclosing, about talking about their abuse, about the aftermath of their disclosure or their report of sexual molestation. And he lived at the Child Advocacy Center, you know, I forget where, Indiana, Columbus, somewhere in the Midwest. Um, but hey man, the nook, you know, we could have put a flowing robe on and a staff and you know, and, and named him Mesmerizing the Nook or something, and um, uh, had an impact similar to Franz Mesmer. But you know, he makes the kids feel better, you know? And, and they, they use these comfort animals with cancer patients, and, and people who have suffered extreme trauma, uh, people who've gone through warfare, and floods, and fires, and different kinds of trauma in their lives. What do these animals do, okay? They're, they're, they, they bring a certain level of comfort to the person who suffered this trauma, and they feel a little bit better. You know, they're very positive creatures. 
Um, now, when you got a guy like Mesmer walking around, and he's not only uh, um, uh, doing things to you and waving his wand around, but he's sending you a positive message. And you may recall, if you go back and look at those, uh, um, that article uh, about the historical perspective on suggestibility, there were other experiments done as well um, regarding the impact of suggestion on how people feel uh, about themselves and uh, the kinds of behaviors uh, that people exhibit. Uh, you know, Mesmer, uh, his last name became the root of uh, mesmerize, right? Um, and what he was using was a form of hypnosis, the power of suggestion, suggestibility, that's what hypnosis is. And, you know, that took America, although Mesmer was in France, uh, hypnosis and its power and potential uh, took America by storm for a certain time period uh, in our history, where people were trying to use hypnosis to uh, get students to do better in school, to get people to um, stop smoking, uh, to get people to lose weight. And today, we still have programs where hypnosis um, is used to uh, change undesirable behaviors and to encourage desirable behaviors. That, class, is the power of suggestion in its earliest forms. Now, um, you know, Mesmer, in some of the research on suggestibility, tells us that suggestibility is not always bad, right? It, it can be harnessed uh, for good reasons, to encourage, as I said, desirable behaviors and to discourage undesirable behaviors. We're going to be talking about the impact and power of suggestion in a different context, and that is the forensic interview. But remember that there were some early studies over the past couple of hundred years on the impact of suggestibility. Now, in uh, the late 17th century, we have another historical moment that's relevant to current um, thought on forensic interviewing and current thought on the believability and credibility of children in the courtroom. Because as I explained last week and I'll reinforce today, forensic interviewing is a particular kind of interviewing, okay? Forensic means of or related to legal proceedings. So the end game here is this interview, the content of this interview, the product of this interview, has a special purpose, and that is to be used in some courtroom somewhere, someday, perhaps. And even if it's not, it has to be the kind of information that ultimately is courtroom worthy, okay? because the purpose of these interviews is either to uh, intervene in a family to protect the child or children from harm from their caregivers, or uh, to punish someone who maltreats children, uh, to prosecute and incarcerate them, or place them on a term of supervision to punish or hold responsible an abuser. Either way, the content or product of those interviews uh, has to be supportable forensically. Because if the family don't want to cooperate with child protection, we got to go to court. If the accused, who is in fact guilty, doesn't want to acknowledge his or her guilt and be punished for their behavior and try to do better next time, we got to go to court. Right? we got to go to court to prove that this thing happened if we want to protect kids and keep families healthy. And we got to go to court if we want to hold this man or woman responsible for maltreatment of a child. Okay, So the end game here is legal proceedings. Sometimes we don't need legal proceedings, and that's good. In fact, most of the time, we don't need to go through legal proceedings. Certainly in the criminal justice system, most of the time, we don't need to go through legal proceedings. And in the family courts, most of the time, you don't have to go through what's called a fact-finding in child protection. But sometimes you do. So in these kinds of cases, we're concerned about the content and product of the interview being defensible in a legal proceeding, uh, ultimately in a court of law. And 
suggestion, the suggestibility of the forensic interviewer um, has the potential to corrupt that child's recollection of what happened in the past. And the last thing we want in a legal proceeding is our, our untruths. Okay? The goal is to find as close to the truth as possible. So we have to be careful about these things. So in the 17th century, we had a trial outside of Boston in Salem Village. And that is relevant for our class because we want to, again, understand how children are perceived in a forensic context, how children are perceived in a courtroom. It, ultimately, they may wind up there for the reasons I just said. Some fact finder, whether it be a judge or whether it be a jury, is going to have to evaluate that child's credibility. They're going to have to evaluate that child's account of the past events. Because the past events are what drives child protection. An accurate understanding of the past events is what drives child protection and is what drives the criminal justice system when we're seeking responsibility for bad acts. So the fact finder, whether it be a judge or a jury, and their perceptions about the believability of children, about the credibility of children, are important. And sadly, the Salem witch trials influences, to this day, believe it or not, influences the average person's perception of the honesty and truthfulness of children. If you were to Google the Salem witch trials, or a witch hunt, or a witch hunt, this afternoon, I guarantee you, you would get thousands and thousands of hits. And there's actually a limiting um, click you can make on Google, and you can tell Google, just give me results for the past month, and I guarantee you would get thousands of hits just for the past month. Month, <coughs> if you put witch hunt or witch trial, okay, in your search um, uh, field. And the reason is, is because the Salem witch trials have become an enduring metaphor for the system gone amok, for bad interview practice, for children's lack of credibility, for a system that can wrongly convict people for things that never happened, okay? And in our world, for things that never happened that arise from the statements of children. Now, what makes Salem and the witch trials so potent a metaphor? And what makes it relevant today, hundreds of years later, is, number one, you had trials. These were not uh, some kind of administrative hearing. This didn't involve some accusation that was resolved at town hall. Uh, these were criminal trials. Much of the process was similar to what we go through today in the criminal justice system and even in the family courts. But you had a judge, they wore black robes, people were sworn, they took an oath to tell the truth, witnesses took the witness stand, they testified, there was cross-examination, there was direct examination. It looked very much like a criminal trial would look today in 2013. Now I mentioned last week what was distinguishable about that time period and the, and the trial in Salem Village and, and, and a modern trial was the kind of evidence that was admissible. Uh, we're talking about spectral evidence and ghost evidence and the evidence of familiars and all this kind of spooky stuff. And, you know, that's the stuff that, you know, gives you a chuckle. But there were very, very different kinds of rules of evidence that governed jurisprudence in um, 17th century colonial America. Very different kind of jurisprudence. Um, Nevertheless, it, it, it has a system of due process. And that's what makes it scary, right? I mean, look what happened here. You had judges, you had people sworn, you had cross-examination. It kind of looks like the way we do business today. And so you have that kind of thing where, where you had the veneer of due process. We had something that looked like due process, right? Then you had children come in, right? You had innocent young children come in. 
honest kids come in, kids from the community come in and give this testimony. And the outcome was so dramatic. And what happened was, based upon the testimonies of those children, 19 people were executed. So you have due process on the one end. You have erroneous testimony by children, right? I don't want to call it false. I don't like, I have no problem with the word false, but I, I worry about using false testimony uh, when we're evaluating child maltreatment prosecutions. Even in 2013, very few, if any, kids come into the courtroom and falsely testify that they were sexually abused, okay? That's, that's my opinion. You know, and I think the research backs us up, uh, you know, how, you know, what, the, what the rates of falsehood are versus non-falsehood, who knows? Uh, but I, I think it's clear that very few children come in and give false testimony, right? I like to use the word erroneous or mistaken, all right? False testimony means a deliberate attempt to deceive so you can get something out of it. To me, that's a, that's a false testimony. I find. So I watched the word false here, okay? Even here, in 17th century Salem Village, I don't think these kids were out lying specifically because they were going to get some kind of payday in some shape, way, shape, or form. You know, maybe, maybe some of the pilers on in the end, you know, wanted to feel good about themselves or wanted to be part of a larger group. You know, who knows? But let's just say that you had due process. You had erroneous testimony of children. That much we can accept, right? There's no such thing as witch, your first name? Yeah. Sarah, there's no such thing as witches, right? What's your thoughts on witch? Kind of? So you think there are witches? Okay. There are no such things as witches. That's my belief system, okay? And I'm talking about witches that come in and do evil and that fly on brooms and hurt people. There's no such thing as witches. The children were 100% wrong. That's what's so startling about it, okay? On the one hand, you have due process. On the other hand, you have children providing erroneous testimony about something that's impossible. And the people who are accused of this Okay, suffered the worst consequence of all, of all in the criminal justice system. They were executed. Uh, contrary to most people's beliefs, I guess, well, I don't know what most people think, but uh, many people believe that witches are burned at the stake. And they were in Europe uh, in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries. But in America, uh, we hanged our witches. So these people were hanged, uh, 18 of them. 19th person died. His name was uh, Giles. Giles? Corey? Corey Giles? Anyway, one man refused to enter a plea because he realized that if you refuse to enter a plea, um, they couldn't go to the next step. There couldn't be a trial. So when they had an arraignment, which is when they bring you before the judge for the first time after you're charged on a complaint, you know, they arrest you. After you're arrested, you've got to come to court. You tell them what your name is, and they tell you your trial date is going to be six months from now. Called an arraignment. So they brought him there for his arraignment, and he remained mute. Because he knew, he picked up that rules of evidence, flipped past the chapter on witchcraft and cats and sorcery and ghosts, and found out that in order to go to trial, you have to enter a plea at your arraignment. And if you remain mute, if you refuse to speak, there will be no trial. He found a loophole in the rules of evidence. But things being the way they were in colonial New England, if you, there's another section of the evidence rule that says, if you refuse to enter a plea, then they take you out of the courtyard behind the courthouse and they place plywood on your chest and men will put giant rocks on top of the plywood until you either enter a plea or you're crushed to death. So Giles Corey, number 19, was crushed to death and the other 18 were hanged. So what you have is due process. You had a trial. You had judges. You had evidence. You had direct and cross-examination. Children took the witness stand. They gave what we know to be erroneous testimony, testimony that was untrue and unsupported by any evidence during that time period, and people died because of it. So it's not surprising that hundreds of years later, we worry about kids' testimony in a courtroom. Okay? And that's why we continue to use witch hunt as a metaphor for a system that's run amok, for a system that totally got it wrong. 
a system that ignores facts, ignores what's logical and reasonable and what makes sense, okay, and a system that results in a dramatic outcome. So the Salem Witch Trials, Franz Mesmer, these are events over the course of history that have something to do with children and forensic interviewing, and that can give us some guidance uh, today. And if you really think about the Salem Witch Trials, the people believe these kids. You know what? These are children. You want to believe them. They should be believed, right? They're, why would they make this up? Why would they provide false testimony? What was their motive? Now, at the beginning of the accusations, you could ask that question legitimately in Salem in the 17th century. But after a while, these girls became popular, and other young girls joined in and made similar accusations. And eventually, these girls ran out of people to choose, for one thing, in Salem Village. So they, they went on the road, if you will, and they went out to the countryside, they went to other villages. So this group would come to your town and would point out, you're witches. And they did that, in fact. If you look at the history of the witch trials, they went to other towns, and we'll find your witches for you. And they made accusations in other communities, in other towns. So, you know, this, this, this kind of validation led to other false accusations in other places. Okay. Now, those people were incarcerated, but it unraveled eventually. And, you know, I said 19 people died. That was it. Although they locked up people in other communities, these girls became a traveling show and, you know, uh, very popular celebrities of the 17th century. They probably had their own reality show now uh, if they were around today. Um, but um, it began to unravel when they accused... I think it might have been the governor's wife of being a witch. You know, you don't want to accuse the governor's wife of being a witch. And, and in the beginning, they picked on the disenfranchised, the old, the, uh, the people who were poor and had no political juice at all. They didn't, they didn't pick on powerful people or people who had uh, substance and, and standing within the community, the beggars and, and those kinds of people. So um, they were, they were um, embraced uh, when they began to point out these people as witches. And, you know, other people who were disliked in the community, people who had boundary disputes, people who, um, uh, uh, you know, didn't follow the rules. This was a very um, uh, religious community. And if they, some people didn't go to church, and some people didn't follow the rules of this Christian enclave, then they, they, were, they were considered undesirable, or, or, or they looked at these folks with skepticism. Now, George Bernard Shaw wrote uh, The Crucible, um, and um, the Salem witch trials have been the subject of popular culture and art and literature and television and movies for years and years and years, right? So that kind of, you know, reinforces our memory and keeps the Salem witch trials fresh and front and center. Among the more recent treatments was uh, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis uh, and um, who was the gal who was running around shoplifting in the 90s? Winona Ryder. Winona Ryder. Winona Ryder as well. Winona Ryder. And Daniel Day-Lewis and a couple of actors, they did a nice job of, um, of a, a, a movie version of, of The Crucible. And um, what's that? It was on this week? Yeah. You know, and they did you know, they, there was Rashid, she was a little on the wild side, and, and Daniel Day-Lewis had his problems with following the rules of the community and things like that. But, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to watch. This is a clip from the film. You know, it's one of these perspective things. I, I, just, I just want you to see, you know, that this was a courtroom. And these are the kids. They got up on the witness stand, and they testified about what they saw. One of the men, I don't know if it's Giles Corey or not, but it was one of the men, and there weren't very many men who were executed. It was mostly women. And there's some really cool feminist literature on not only the witch trials in, in Salem in the 17th century, but all of the European witch trials that looks at, you know, uh, these witch accusations and these witch prosecutions through the lens of feminism. And it's rather interesting that uh, very few men were burned in Europe. You know, it was nearly all women. And similarly, in, uh, in Salem Village, it was nearly, nearly all women as well. I think it was one or two men, and this was one of the men. Uh, he's an old man, and he's being accused of climbing through the window to do something horrid in the girl's, in the girl's um, home. And one of the things that really struck the townsfolk and the, and the people who were watching these trials as they occurred was that the children seemed to have these spasms 
which they felt added to their credibility, I think, that, that they were uncontrollable and they were writhing on the floor and they were acting in weird ways. Some modern analysis of the witch trials points to um, some bacteria in the rye germ. I haven't looked at this in a while, but they might have, bad bread may have caused some of this, um, and the kids might have been affected by it, and it might have caused some of the epileptic like seizures that they exhibited in the courtroom. So not only do you have children giving compelling testimony about being victims of sorcery and witchcraft, you have these you know, involuntary movements that they engaged in. And that fed right into witchcraft, right? Oh my God, they're jumping around. They are possessed. And nobody disputes that they didn't do that. Now, did they do that on purpose to get over, to be, you know, feel good about themselves, and to be treated like the uh, traveling rock stars they became? Or were they affected by some bacteria? Who knows? Uh, there's been plenty of analysis. We, we may never know completely what the heck was going on up there, but we do know that people were executed after criminal trials um, in a court of law. This little gal is named Ruth Putnam. One of the child witnesses. Daniel Day-Lewis. I'm not sure why this thing keeps doing this. It's a lot longer than that, the clip. What's... What's... It says 129. I'm going to give it one more time. And I'm done. Oh, uh, Ruth Putnam, when did you last see Mr. Jacobs? Sigmund Freud, okay? Sigmund Freud uh, was a psychiatrist from Austria who was uh, probably, uh, and I don't think it's arguable at all, the most well-known psychiatrist uh, in 
history. Um, but Sigmund Freud uh, had a theory about the women who he was treating in his psychiatry practice. And this, this history has an impact upon how kids, and especially women and children, are perceived in the courtroom when it comes to allegations of sexual abuse. You know, see, see, Freud was treating his female patients for a variety of neuroses and, and issues that they were having as adults. And the more he listened to them, the more he heard stories of childhood incest and sexual abuse. And the more he began to conclude that their adult neuroses, that the problems they were having adjusting to life as an adult and problems they were having with intimacy and dealing with members of the opposite sex and dealing with trust, were related to childhood molestation and the fact that they were uh, abused by their fathers. The problem was when he began to promote this theory and we began to go to conferences and to share his uh, theory on the source of his patients and the female patients' neuroses, he was met with great derision. He was not very popular. Um, in fact, the other psychiatrists were quite dismissive of him, and his reputation was suffering. So in perhaps one of the greatest acts of cowardice uh, there ever was, he, he retooled Freud, his theory on uh, the source of his patient's neuroses, uh, just a bit. He said, well, these women that I've been seeing, and it's my theory that their neuroses and their difficulties they're having as adults with intimacy and, and feelings of... Uh, trust uh, with people they care about and love uh, is related to their fantasies about being sexually abused by their parents. And the fantasy, the notion of female adults and female children fantasizing about sexual conduct with their fathers um, uh, influences in some ways thought even today. Um, how many people believe that women and children fantasize about sexual contact and conduct with their fathers? Today, I don't know, but back then, um, it was uh, something that was uh, received and had credibility and, 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 and came from Freud. Um, and, you know, I bring that up because there is still a degree of distrust and skepticism about sexual abuse allegations that arise from female children and females in general, from women. And some of that, I would suggest, has its roots in this faulty nonsense that Freud offered us um, uh, back many, many years ago. Okay? It is very difficult to prove sexual abuse allegations in the civil courts, never mind the criminal courts. They are very difficult prosecutions. You will see after you take this course, if you pay the least bit of attention to the news, to the ways that the criminal justice system handles violence against, sexual violence against women and female children, you will see that they're treated much differently. Okay? Victims become accusers. Okay? There's only one place you see that. That's in allegations of sexual abuse or sexual assault. I challenge you to find the word accuser in any other context. You know, the woman and the child become accusers. The mugging victim, the robbery victim, it's not the robbery accuser, it's not the mugging accuser, it's only women and children who become accusers. Which to me, the word accuser has a negative connotation, okay? The simple way for the media to handle that is to call it the alleged victim, okay? You're covered, alleged victim. We know they could be wrong. We understand they could be lying. We understand they may be fantasizing about sex with their father. We get that, okay? But let's call them the alleged victim. That'll work for me. And I follow when this change began to take place, and it was after the Michael Jackson case. Kobe Bryant, Michael Jackson case. It's Kobe Bryant being the power forward for the Los Angeles Lakers. I mean, the small forward shooting guard for the Los Angeles Lakers who was accused of sexually assaulting some woman who worked at a hotel in Colorado. Um, that case was later dismissed and it was unprovable. In the Michael Jackson case, he was accused of sexually abusing OA children who were in his care at his, his ranch. Um, right around the time of both of those cases, which were in the you know, early millennium, uh, we began to see the shift from victim to accuser in the context of sexual, sexual abuse. 
But yes, women and female children, very tough prosecution. There's a skepticism among people, and I talk more about this in the children justice class, but there's a skepticism among the average person anytime there's an allegation of sexual abuse made or sexual assault or rape. You know, you almost have to, uh, you know, have super proof of it. Someone gets robbed, someone gets shot at, someone, you know, uh, has their home burglarized. They walk in and they're given an even hand and an even evaluation by a jury or by a fact finder. Someone comes in and says they're sexually assaulted, we raise an eyebrow. We want to hear more. We want super proof. So I'm pretty confident after a career in doing this stuff that it is not only very difficult to prove allegations of sexual assault where the accusations arise from a, a woman or a female child, um, uh, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that they're dealt with differently and you have to provide significant proof, more than the kind of proof you would need in your average case when it comes to those kinds of violence upon women and female children. So, you know, they really don't get a fair shake in the courtroom. You know, and, and there are ways around that. There is a ways to deal with that as a prosecutor or a deputy attorney general who handles these cases regularly, to deal with the legacy of Freud and the legacy of uh, the um, Salem witch trials. Um, there are ways around that, and, and uh, part of it has to do with doing better investigative work, doing a better job investigating cases. Even though, even though it's going to be a lot more heavy lifting, even though it's going to be a lot of work to convince a judge or a jury that this child was in fact maltreated, sexually maltreated. Um, physical abuse is a little bit different. We'll talk about that at the end of this semester. Um, or an adult woman was sexually assaulted. Even though it's going to be a little bit more difficult to convince people, if you develop good habits and you use best practices, you might be able to get past that skepticism and be able to prove uh, that a child was in fact sexually molested or that a woman was sexually assaulted. Um, and, um, you know, where does it start? It starts with the forensic interview. That's where it all starts. You know, developing good habits when you interview the child and doing a good interview, one that is perceived and embraced as credible, um, goes a long way to climbing the hill towards a successful prosecution, whether it be in family or court, or criminal court, okay? And, you know, even though it's going to be difficult, and even though the judge and jury are primed to not believe the female child or the adult woman, uh, you can get past that by using good practice um, and by doing everything you can to not only shine a light on the credibility and believability of that person, um, but also to eliminate or rebut or deal with any allegations that they made it up or fabricated or fantasized uh, for some other reason other than the truthfulness. And we'll talk about all those things this semester, each and every one of them. So those are your three watershed big time moments in the history uh, that have to do with uh, you know, how we interview kids today. Uh, the um, uh, Franz Mesmer, uh, our friend from uh, France, uh, the Salem Witch Trials, and, and, and Sigmund Freud, uh, events throughout history uh, that continue to impact uh, how people think about um, sexual abuse of kids and women. Any questions about the historical perspective of all this stuff? Any examples, recollections? Is this class, are you diapers workers or not diapers workers? No one's a diapers worker here. We're DCP and P. Okay, good. Very good. Well, let's take a look at the chapters in Professor Fowler's book um, that you were responsible for. And it's a nice segue because we were talking about you know, what the end game is, what the purpose is, what the um, uh, word forensic means. And I said the content and product of the interview uh, is uh, something that will wind up in some legal proceeding somewhere, and perhaps someday, right? So that is true. That's what a forensic interview is. Professor Fowler starts out in Chapter 1 by contrasting what forensic 
interviewing is and clinical interviewing is. She starts out by saying forensic and clinical interviewer roles in child sexual abuse. She also makes the observation that a wide variety of people from different disciplines may interview a child about abuse. Okay? Persons assessing children for possible sexual abuse may be healthcare professionals, right? Forensic nurses, what we call in New Jersey, and in many places throughout the country, SANE nurses. It's an acronym, Sexual Assault Nurse Examiner. They may interview a child, depending upon what's going on in a particular community. Do we have any nurses in the house? No? SANE nurses, of course, doctors may interview a child about sexual abuse. Other paraprofessionals in the hospital or a pediatric setting may interview a child um, about sexual abuse. You know, many, many of these children have their first contact with the system after there is a suspicion about sexual abuse. Where? Where do you think that might be? In the doctor's office, at the hospital, or at the pediatrician's office. And part of the reason is, is because and we'll talk about medical evidence later, and we talk about it more in Children and Justice, but part of the reason is many caregivers think that there's a um, diagnostic tool where we can tell if a child was sexually abused. And, and sadly, and many people think that, you may think that, and that's okay, I used to think that as well, but if you went to a cocktail party, you know, uh, the first thing many people would say if you said, I think so-and-so is molesting this child, or your child, or your niece, or whoever it may be, you say, did you take her to the doctor? Why? Because the doctor's going to look and then tell us whether the child was sexually abused. But it doesn't work that way, and we'll, we'll learn why it doesn't work that way, that there's no such thing as virginity. A virginity is uh, just a, 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 you know, an artificial construct. Uh, it, it's medically and clinically a fiction. Um, and so if there's no such thing as virginity, virginity meaning a state of... Me a state, when I say... Someone could never have sex, and if the definition of virginity is I never had sex, then indeed there are virgins. I'm not saying that. But there's no diagnostic tools to determine virginity. Let me say that. Okay? You can't tell, okay, we can't tell um, whether someone's a virgin or not by using powerful microscopes or, uh, you know, bright lights uh, or anything else like that. Um, we, can, we can assess trauma. You know, we can assess trauma to the female genitalia. There's no doubt about that. The source of that trauma, we don't know. Now, there are very few reasons why the female genitalia would have uh, uh, trauma. Uh, so when you take the history from a child or a woman or, or their statements about abuse, and then you find trauma, we can say, hey, that trauma, you know, that bruising, uh, that hematoma, that bleeding, that cut, that notch, that's consistent with, the history provided, the account that was provided by the patient, okay? But that doesn't mean they never had sex. So anyway, I'm digressing to stuff we'll talk about later. The point is, is the perception is, even among jurors today, I mean, I have to disabuse them of this all the time. I have to set the record straight. I bring in expert witnesses to testify not about what they found, not about the evidence, not about the fact that the child came to the doctor and the doctor showed a bright light on the child and used all these uh, uh, clinical devices and concluded that the child's abused, I bring the doctor in to say, listen, we can't tell. You know, Medicine can't give you the answer of whether that man had intercourse with that child. That's unknowable from a medical perspective, okay? So that's why I bring doctors in. But that's the complete opposite is the perception among everybody else. And, you know, the, what, what, what hymenal tissue is and means completely different thing. I'm not sure if we get into this in this class later or my other class, but uh, nevertheless, um, there, is, there is no clinical way to determine whether a child was sexually abused. The general public thinks otherwise, so most of these cases arise, not most, not most at all, many, a large number of them, are, the, the mother takes the kid to the doctor or the ER. That's where the case starts. Get a call, ER. Mother's here, why? Said this, that, or the other thing about some man um, sometimes a woman sexually touching or assaulting their child. So the doctor, they don't say, oh, bring in the prosecutors, the detectives, the police. You know, they report it, but the doctor's still got to take a history. 
you know, especially if there's injury or trauma or the child uh, um, is um, medically vulnerable in some way, if there's some risk of uh, harm to the child or some health concern, the doctor supersedes everybody. You know, in, in our community, I could tell everybody in the whole county, step back, we're taking over. I can't tell that to the doctor. But we're on such good terms and we work in a multidisciplinary context where the doctor will go, you know, I'm going to do a quick screening, but I don't even need to ask her questions about that. This child's not at risk. It happened some time ago, according to the report. Um, you guys take over, and then I can evaluate the child more fully some other day. Because the doctor understands there's no time like today, okay? When, when, when if you ever take the class, when we talk about investigation, how to do a competent quality investigation into child maltreatment. But you'll see the number one rule, the cardinal rule, is you gotta, you gotta, you gotta attack the issue immediately. Not even one or two hours later. Today, now, now, now. If I gotta call now, my lieutenant was sitting over there, and I'm sitting over here, and a couple of detectives over there. Mother's at the doctor's office, says that the uncle who lives upstairs put his finger in the daughter, in her daughter's vagina. Okay, when do we get up and go? Now, now. Well, the uncle's is in here for another hour. I don't care. Go get the mother. Go get the child. Where's the uncle? He's over there at work. Go get him. Bring him through a different door. You need to do this now because there's so many, there's so much potential um, for the truth, for the truth to get contaminated in some way. Because remember, I just described who. Who's the accused in my little quick hypothetical I threw out there? The uncle. Who might the uncle, what does that mean, the uncle? Who might he be related to? Mother, right? Could be the mother's brother. Even if it ain't the mother's brother, it's her man's brother, her husband's brother, right? This, these are intimate. These are people, you know, who they have a certain amount of loyalty to, right? You know, so the, the truth begins to turn and turn and turn into different shapes as you let time go by. So you want to respond immediately before people can cross contaminate one another based upon loyalties and interests that are greater than the child's health and well-being. Okay. They may not look at it that way, but it's what's happening. So you respond right away. You respond right away. And many times, the first allegation, uh, the first report comes from a doctor's office. So Professor Fowler says, many people interview kids, S nurses, doctors, hospital personnel, pediatric personnel, social workers who work in pediatricians' offices, social workers who work in hospitals, social workers who work in medi centers, right? Based upon the scenario I just provided you, a lot of times that's where they wind up. And that's why the first people that talk to the child about what may or may not have happened to them are medical professionals. Okay? So we think of forensic interviewing. We think about interviewing. I don't know what you think, but many people may think that, you know, oh, okay, they got some specialized person or some DIFUS worker, DCPP worker that comes in, knows what they're doing. Yeah, maybe, but not now. You know, there's sometimes the child may be spoken to or interviewed about what may have happened one or two times before uh, the best personnel um, in interviewing children, a forensic interviewer, uh, comes in and, and does a comprehensive um, protocolized interview of the child, one that has some structure. So hospitals, doctors, social workers, uh, mental health professionals too. Sometimes children will be or adults may be in treatment for something by a mental health professional, and in the context of that treatment, may disclose that they were sexually abused uh, by a, um, uh, a family member or some other person. A father, for instance, Sigmund Freud. Where did his, you know, where did his disclosures come? He was in treatment. He was talking to the women in treatment. He was doing what was, you know, he's a pioneer of talk therapy, right? He's talking to them, and they're going. You know, I can't do this, this bothers me, that bothers me, I'm having a hard time with my husband, I'm a hard time with intimacy. And, and then sometime during the course of that talk therapy, they disclose to Dr. Sigmund Freud that they were sexually abused by their parents. So rather than the disclosure arise in the doctor's office, like I described, another place that it sometimes comes up is in therapy. Lots of times, actually. That's another, you know, pie chart. If you made a pie chart, that would have a nice chunk of pie. Um, describing the percentage of disclosures uh, that see the light of day that wind up in forensic interviewers' uh, laps, uh, a, a, a significant amount come from mental health professionals. So 
you know, Professor Fowler in, in, in your book, and thank you, Sarah, Sarah right? Thank you, Sarah, for letting me use your book. Uh, Professor Fowler in chapter one talks about the different people who may interview kids uh, and medical workers, mental health professionals. All right? Obviously, police officers. You know, sometimes the mother doesn't call the hospital or the ambulance right away. They call the police. Dial 911, 911, 911. Okay, everybody descends upon the family home. Right? Brothers upstairs hiding in the attic somewhere. Cops come. They may speak to the child. They may interview the child about what just happened. Right? Sometimes, by the time the police get there, the mother spoke to the child. No. Auntie Maria spoke to the child. Somebody else who's smart and they trust may have spoke to the child. What we try to reduce, but we have no control over many times, is the amount of times the child has to be interviewed. And I'm just giving you an example where at the moment the police get to the door, a child may have been interviewed three times. Not always, but sometimes that happens. Now the police officers say it can't so they go, all right, uh, I believe you, everybody in the car. You know, many times police officers will crouch down and, and talk to the child, do at least a basic Q&A, a couple of questions, find out what the heck's going on. Um, but they, they will, we'll, we'll call it interview children, okay? It's not comprehensive. Um, but, you know, they'll interact with a child and ask that child questions. So there's a number of people and professionals who will interact with a child. Um, but if you want to think about formal interviews, okay, and you know, the, the doctor who gets a history is, is kind of a formal interview, but if you want to think about formal interviews where the goal of the interview is to find out what happened about the past sexual abuse, excuse me, and you can make an appointment to do it, let's call it that, none of these other things are appointment based. You know, in the world of formal interviews where everybody on the same page, an appointment is made, and a child's going to be interviewed. There's two main kinds of interviews forensic and clinical. Okay. Forensic and clinical. Forensic is what we've been talking about, the end game of the legal proceeding. Where the historical truth is paramount. What happened? What really happened to this child? The forensic interviewer wants to get as close to the truth as they can because they want to protect the family or they want to punish somebody. Put them in jail, punish them. And, it, and, it, and we want to know what happened in the past. The clinical interviewer wants to know what happened in the past, but they don't place as much of a premium on the historical truth, what really happened. They're more concerned about what the child feels happened. So you can see a little bit of tension between those two kind of things, right? Does the court give a damn what the child feels about what happened? If a guy's going to go to jail for 16 years, is the child's feelings about what happened rather than what really happened important? No, no. Forensic interviewer, you got to get here looking for the, the hard truth. Because our, when I say our law enforcement's duty, right? Law enforcement's duty is to the to the notion of responsibility. Who's responsible, and how do we stop this from happening, and how do we punish the person that's responsible? And you can't do that unless you're reasonably confident that it happened. What's the goal of the mental health professional, the therapist, the psychologist, who is evaluating and treating a, a child who may have been sexually abused? What are they trying to do? What's their end game? Yeah, to provide support, to overcome the trauma, to help them function better. You know, if there was no criminal justice system and uh, there was no threat of prosecution, sometimes the guy's dead, right? The, 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 the abuser's dead, but the, the same kind of therapy will go on with the child. Now, whether she was in fact abused, whether she was simply fondled but not penetrated, you know, the, the therapist, in large part, it doesn't matter to her. Her fealty, her loyalty is to the child or the, 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 the patient, right? They want to make sure that this patient can get well, can be supported, can function, can go to work, can go to school, to get past, you know, whatever issues they have that are dragging them down and impacting upon their ability to function normally in life. 
So the historical truth important, but it's not that important. If the child believes their father did X, Y, and Z to them, and that is intrusive, that is disruptive to that child's functioning day to day, then the doctor, the clinician, the psychologist is going to deal with that. Right? So whether it happened more than once or five times or involved over the clothes or under the clothes or, or it happened at all, you know, it's, it's not that important to the clinician. But to the criminal justice system it is. So you see how they, they, now I'm not saying the therapist doesn't want to know what really happened. They're in a much better position if they know what really happened, but it's not as important. Right? And the best example I could think of is if the perpetrator's dead, you know, the therapist still wants to know what happened in the past, but it's not that critical. You know, their, their goal is to help this person, not to punish that person. Too good. So you can see that they're different. And that's where we get to the interviewer has to avoid dual roles. I don't use the word avoid. I say you should never have dual roles. And you don't know what that means yet, but I'll explain it to you and then we're going to take a short break, okay? Dual roles means this. Many clinicians, many therapists are very, very smart people, very well-educated people, probably in the best position to conduct an interview with a child about sexual abuse than anyone else in their community. They have experience working with children. They have experience with children's cognition, the way they think, the way they express themselves. You know, so there's a temptation to have this person also interview the child. Right? And you have to be very careful with that. And to use an example of a colleague who we worked with here, um, there was a case that um, many years in the past now, it seems fresh to me, but it's many years in the past now. It happened right here in New Jersey. And it, and it had... Um, uh, uh, national, uh, it was it was it was nationally relevant. Uh, it was on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine, Time magazine, and all the newspapers, and it involved uh, a bunch of boys who were high school boys in Essex County, in a, a town called Glen Ridge, and these these boys had uh, um, uh, convinced a, a developmentally disabled girl who was I don't know she was 16. I think she was 16. Uh, they convinced her to, to come in their basement. And these were boys who were high-functioning, their police lieutenant's son, captain of the football team, you know, living in um, uh, uh, um, beautiful homes. And uh, there was a bunch of them, uh, I don't remember how many, too many uh, boys that brought this one girl and they sexually assaulted her in the basement uh, of one of the boys' homes. And um, uh, Glenn Goldberg, who was the prosecutor in the case, and they've written a number of books about it, uh, made some observation like uh, this, this was less like a sexual assault and more like a science experiment, the things they did to this child, including penetrating her with a baseball bat, but it was the only ceremonial bat. I used to get a little bat that gave, that gave you a Yankee game or something. It did other horrid things to her. But because she was over 16, she could consent. The age of consent in New Jersey is 16, unless it's a character that can't consent to sex with your father or a jail guard or a probation officer or a therapist, those kind of folks. Okay, somebody who has power and authority, a teacher, you can't consent to sex with your teacher or your dad at 16. But as to the rest of the world, 16 is the age of consent. And in this case, this girl could consent to sex with one or all of them. It doesn't really matter. Uh, that's her prerogative. So the theory of the prosecution was that she was unable to provide meaningful consent, that she was developmentally disabled, okay? And she could provide meaningful and informed consent. That was the linchpin of the prosecution. And I remember the defense lawyers calling me. They were friendly with me at the time. They were like, Joe, we got this tape, and the girl describes, um, we want to get it in, we want to use it in the defense, and, and um, she's describing the... Um, What, which, what they did was they wired up one of the boys. She still liked one of them. She really liked one of them. It was Kyle and Glenn. Kyle Scherzer. Anyway, she liked one of the football players. And even after the breasts were made and was in the news and all that, she, she continued to have contact. Um, uh, well, she didn't even have to have contact. They called her, one of the boys. The lawyers taped it. They put them up to it. And they got her to talk about 
And they were focusing on her, bless you. They were focusing on her promiscuity, bless you. And um, so they wired the kid, or they sit on the phone, and they talk to her on the phone. And she describes something called, uh, it might have been an atomic blowjob or something like that, some kind of wacky characterization of a sex act that she either was going to perform or did perform or liked to perform. You know, I remember telling the lawyer, I said, Louie, you've got to be careful of that kind of stuff because it, it, it shows such a lack of awareness. The other thing was she, she, she was indifferent to who she had sex with that day. You know, they, they, they were emphasizing her lack of discretion and her promise, I don't even know if promise beauty is the right word, but her lack of discretion, uh, do whatever they, I go, Louie, the more you do that, the more you're going to show that she's incompetent and unable to make informed decisions. The more you're painting her out to be sexually indiscriminate, the more you paint her out to be uh, uh, someone who doesn't care how it's done and wants to please everybody, the more you're playing into the prosecution's hands with it, if you want to go that route. Now he's asking me as another lawyer, you know, what my thoughts were. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm giving the guy legal advice here. And eventually, I'm not even sure that that tape got into evidence. In any event, so the centerpiece of the prosecution is that the girl is developmentally disabled and she cannot make a meaningful um, decision on consent. Well, Dr. Eskelin evaluated her and became her therapist, the girl. At the same time, the prosecution offered Dr. Eskelin as an expert witness on the issue of whether this girl could provide meaningful consent. Because that was an element of the prosecution. Okay? So let me tell you a little a quick aside about elements of crimes. A burglary is when you enter a dwelling, a home, we'll say. A burglary is when you enter the home of another without permission with the intent to take something that doesn't belong to you. Whenever we ask jurors in, if they've ever been a victim of crime, they invariably say, I, my house was robbed. My, my apartment was robbed. Uh, my car was robbed. Well, if they took your house on a flatbed and brought it to another state, they would have robbed your house. Robbery is the taking of an item and exercising control over it as if it was your own. What they're trying to say is my house was burglarized, because that's the legal definition. Burglary means Entering a dwelling without permission, right? With the intent to take something, steal something. It's actually to commit a crime. But for our purposes, entering a dwelling without permission with the intent to steal something. So if a homeless dude busts a window open in a church, climbs in because it's freezing out, and lays in a pew and feels warm, right? He may have trespassed, but he ain't no burglar because he certainly entered a dwelling without permission, but he didn't intend to commit a crime in there, right? All he did was want to get warm. So those are the elements, though, and I just want to emphasize what elements are. The elements of burglary are enter a dwelling, one, without permission, two, with the intent to commit a crime, with the intent to commit a crime inside, three, so one, two, three. The prosecution has to prove each element beyond the reasonable doubt, all three. You can prove that he broke in, you can prove that he didn't have permission, but you can't prove what he was doing in there. We have to infer what his motive was, breaking into someone's home. He ain't got a burglary. Charge is dismissed. Back to the Brunbridge rape case. Sexual penetration, right? On a, the the um, uh, element was called upon a child who was, um, I don't know if I have the uh, criminal code with me, but the elements are sexually, sexual penetration um, uh, upon a child, uh, no, upon a person who's unable to give consent. Psycho, we'll call it, this is an exact thing, but for our purposes, sexual penetration upon a person who's unable to give informed consent. So the prosecution was able to prove, that's an easy one, penetration, we know that happened. How do we know this girl can't give informed consent? We don't know her. Most people 16 and above can give informed consent. They know what's right and what's left and what's going on and you know, where babies come from. And you only need to have a rudimentary understanding of human sexuality. So in order to prove its case, the prosecutor said, all right, we can prove penetration. We've got to prove that this girl could have given informed consent, that she had the, the lack of psychological capacity. We'll use Dr. Eskelin. 
We'll use the same doctor who's treating her to come in and be an expert on whether this girl had the ability to give informed consent. And that's where we say interviewers need to avoid dual, road, uh, dual roles, D-U-A-L, two roles, dual roles, because the interests are different. And that's what I've been driving at here. Right? I, I just explained 15 minutes ago that the, the therapeutic interviewer, right, the therapist, the clinician, the psychologist, is different from the forensic interviewer. The forensic interviewer has to know the real truth as much as they can get it. The therapist is not that interested in that. So what happens is you have a conflict, right? You have a conflict here with a prosecution expert, right? The prosecution's expert is wearing two hats. They're engaged in dual or two roles and they're not a perfect fit. So Dr. Eskelin was easy cross-examination on that point. You know? That her, she had to answer that the truth of what the child was telling her was not as important as the child's feelings. She had to answer that if she's a child's therapist. But that's one of the foundations of therapy. Now, you don't have to say it quite that way. There are ways to explain it. And Dr. Eskelin is brilliant, and she's a professor at this university, and that superstar in the field of uh, uh, child therapy uh, for victims of sexual abuse. But in that day, in that case, she had a rocky cross-examination because you need to avoid the dual roles of you're either a therapist or you're either a fact finder for the prosecutor. It's hard for her to be both, right? It's hard for her, for her to be the child's therapist where what really happened, where the child's feelings um, are relevant and also the fact finder for the prosecutor. And that's what Professor, you know, that's just a, a concrete example to talk about what Professor Fowler's talking about here is forensic versus clinical practice, okay? And she even has a table where she has a bunch of, um, excuse me, um, descriptions of the goal of forensic and clinical practice, okay? Forensic, the client is the court. Clinical, the client's the child. So you're working not for the court or the prosecutor, you're working for the child. So your loyalty, above all, is to the child, not to the truth, but to the child. And that's not saying the therapist is coming in an outright lie, but the way she looks at the world, the way she looks at her relationship with this child, is quite different than if she was hired as a fact finder. Your stance, S-T-N-C-E, forensic, neutral. Clinical, supportive. Types of data. Forensic, I told you this before. Forensic, just the facts. Types of data, clinical, subjective experience. Subjective means the victim's point of view. What the victim remembers about her experience. Not just the facts, the subjective experience of the victim, which is appropriate and right, and what's great about therapy but got to be careful. You can't serve two masters, the court or the kid. Structure, and they go on and on, and you have to be careful. And therapists rarely video record the interviews, where most um, progressive uh, law enforcement video record the interviews with the child. Now, Professor Fowler talks more and more about this forensic clinical dichotomy. I think I've expressed it expressed it well enough that you have a basic understanding of it, but make sure you take a look at this chapter again, you know, before the midterm, uh, based upon, you know, what I just told you now. Take a quick look through it again, and you have some nice highlights here. Focus on those highlights. That's exactly what I've been looking at, too. It's been helpful to me. Um, but take a look at that, and especially look at the exceptions to the forensic clinical dichotomy, okay? Um, Okay. Let's take a five-minute break, and then we'll resume. Any questions, by the way, about uh, any of what we talked about, the historical context, the dichotomy and all that, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, sure. She did She was a child's therapist, and she was also called upon to give testimony about the child's ability to provide a form of
Well, yeah, I'm trying to argue that the, the reason why um, this is problematic is because there's a conflict of interest. Conflict of interest uh, put, uh, you know, in, in basic terms is no one can serve two masters, right? Neither the lawyer, either service one or another. So, yeah. I'm not suggesting Dr. Eskelin engage in a knowing conflict of interest, which should be sanctioned by the American Psychological Association. Um, and no one even believes that. In fact, the American Psychological Association has guidelines about this kind of thing. And they say, avoid. They don't say you can't do it. So legally it is not to be done. Yes, legally it is not to be done. Now, I don't know about every jurisdiction. Maybe in Nevada, you know, it's an administrative rule and you know, be sued civilly in Nevada for all I know. But at least in New Jersey, the best of my knowledge is you can do it. It's not a crime. It's not an offense. It's not a civil violation. Um, but it's something that you need to avoid. Because the, the conflict is not that apparent on its face. You know, it's like, oh, what's the big deal? The prosecutor didn't think anything of it back then. He's like, oh, we'll get Dr. Eskin to do it. She's great. She knows what she's doing. We'll bring her in. You know? This is going to be good. We're going to have to pay. You know, she's already treating the child. It's, it's good news. So, you know, it, 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 this is not as... You know, you, you can't be a probation officer and work for the court and also be the defense lawyer for the accused. Okay, yeah. Now, I'm not just saying that one you can go to jail for. Right. Everybody knows that. That's pretty self-evident. But here it's a little bit nuanced, and I'm, I'm trying to show you how it's, you know, the different, you know, the kind of jive. And at the same time, I'm trying to teach you that they are different. Because we're going to run into, you know, you're going to be a forensic interviewer. That's not a clinical letter. So what's right. the difference? Right. So that's kind of, I'm trying to hide that. Okay, let's pick up. This is September 17, 2013, Forensic Interviewing of Children, Part 2. I um, just want to let you know, I don't think any of you would do this, but it, don't save anything on this computer thinking about, thinking that you will be here next week and then you can get whatever you saved on this computer because... IT tells me they're going to put new software on all the computers in this room so they're going to delete everything that's on these computers. I don't know that anybody who stores data on this computer. But if you were going to save a document on here thinking we'll just click on it next week, it won't be there. Yeah, I don't know. This one has been on since I got it. It was already on when you got in the room. I think I like that one. It's been on ever since. Okay, that's all right. Just as long as you're not putting anything on oh, there no, no. I have that you been. wanted to save for yourself. No, I have my iPad. Right. Um, I want to um, go over uh, some of the issues that um, are identified in forensic interviewing in this article here, how sexual abuse interviews go astray, implications for prosecutors, police, and child protection by Wood and Garvin from the University of Texas, El Paso. Okay? And again, this, is, this article is an overview. And it talks about things that we're going to look at in greater detail later on this semester. So it just introduces us to the kinds of issues that you're going to learn about later on in the course and that are relevant in forensic interviewing of children. Uh, interestingly, most of the time we talk about what not to do rather than what to do. Um, and a lot of this article is descriptive of what not to do. Um, although there are some aspects of the article that do talk about best practice or what you should do rather than what not to do. But the authors, Wood and Garvin, make the observation that uh, certain techniques in forensic interviewing over the years have been widely criticized because they have the potential, either real or perceived, uh, to elicit false allegations from children. And they're saying to us, listen, there's a reason why we want to do a good job interviewing kids. It's because if we do a poor job, it has the potential to elicit false allegations from children. And if there are false allegations, uh, again, I prefer erroneous allegations from children, uh, that obviously can have a very negative impact upon people's lives, especially the accused. 
and Wood and Garvin talk about something that I mentioned uh, front and center earlier this evening, suggestiveness. That's an issue that we're going to learn about. That's an issue that we have to be mindful of. That's an issue that we have to be vigilant about when we conduct forensic interviews of children. As Wood and Garvin state, this occurs when the interviewer, rather than the child, introduces new information about the topic of concern in an interview. That's one way to look at suggestiveness, when the interviewer introduces facts or information rather than the child. Leading information? Yeah, one, I'm sorry? Would that be leading information? Yeah, that's one way to think about suggestiveness, and that is by leading the child, um, by suggesting to the child what the response should be rather than allowing the child to give the response. I prepared a power, married a PowerPoint that I have not used in this class this past weekend uh, that I'm going to put later on in the learning units. Uh, you haven't gotten there yet. It's going to be a few weeks. But what I talk about there is what's called the process of inquiry. And I address the kinds of questions that a good forensic interviewer uh, needs to use. Okay? I will give you a narrative PowerPoint later in the semester about best practice when it comes to questions. And just to give you some insight, um, it's called the process of inquiry. And one of the metaphors that we use about the process of inquiry, meaning, you know, inquiry meaning questioning, inquiry, asking about, um, uh, one of the metaphors that we use is a funnel. You know, when a funnel is wide at the top and then it gets narrower and narrower, and at the bottom it's very closed. So when you start out questioning a child, you want to be as wide open as possible. And sometimes you may need to ask questions that are a little narrower or a little more direct, maybe a little narrower and a little more narrower. Um, but you want to be up here as much as possible. But sometimes open-ended questions don't get the information from the child. So you may need to be a little bit more direct. Sometimes you may need to be even a little bit leading. But you should always follow a leading question or even a suggestive question with an open-ended question. So the process of inquiry addresses the kinds of inquiry or the kinds of questions that you ask the child. And at the end of that PowerPoint, I make this observation. You can tell whether an interviewer is using good questions, whether they are being faithful to best practice with the process of inquiry by watching an interview and seeing who's doing most of the talking. If the interviewer's doing a lot of talking and the child's not doing so much talking, you're not using best case practice. The likelihood is you're being suggested or leading or worse, misleading. The gold standard, the ideal, is when the child does most of the talking and the interviewer is just, uh-huh, tell me more about that. And then, what happened next? Tell me more. What happened after that? What happened next? Tell me more about that and let the child narrate. The goal is to get the child to narrate or to tell the story about what happened, to tell what happened in the past. So good practice, the interviewer doesn't do much talking at all, the child does most of the talking. You know, poor practice, the interviewer does a lot of yakking and the child doesn't do that much talking. If the interviewer is doing a lot of talking, there is the potential for the interview to be suggested, and that's what we want to avoid. We want to avoid, as um, Wood and Gervin say, we want to avoid a situation where the interviewer, rather than the child, introduces new information. Many studies have shown that the interviewer, uh, that interviewer suggestiveness can reduce the accuracy of an interview. And again, we want to know the historical truth. We want to know what really happened. And if being suggestive reduces the accuracy, the truthfulness of what's coming out of the child, um, then we are not using good case practice. And we may wind up with a statement by the child or statements by the child uh, that are erroneous and then have a, a negative outcome where somebody who's not in fact guilty gets prosecuted or convicted, or some family who is not abusive has child protection intervening in their home, and 
we need to avoid that kind of stuff. So they offer suggestiveness. That's something we need to worry about. That's something that we'll talk about later. They talk about influence. We want to avoid influence. Now that's a little bit different from suggestibility. They say it includes um, inducing social conformity by telling the child what other people believe or have said about the topic of concern. You know, we think, we think um, the gym teacher did something to you back there, and we need to know about that, okay? That's a little different from suggestive in a way. Influencing a child is a subset of suggestiveness, I guess. Um, we want to avoid that, but the focus here on this kind of poor interview practice is that the interviewer is trying to influence the child so that they give responses because they want to be like other people. They want to um, have a, a um, um, positive feeling about joining what the other kids or other people are saying. Another way to be influential um, rather than simply suggestive is um, to elicit obedience to authority by telling the child the interviewer's point of view. So that's another way to, to use poor interview practice, to tell how they think. And I just gave you kind of an example of that. We think something happened with the gym teacher in the cloakroom. We need to hear about that. So you have to be careful about those kinds of things. That's an example of influencing the child, inducing stereotypes by describing the alleged perpetrator in a negative way. We'll talk more about that, especially with something called the Sam Stone study. When we talk about suggestibility, I will um, explain to you uh, the research that was done by Professor C.C. and Professor Brock um, on how children might be influenced by forensic interviewers poor questioning involving a study called the Sam Stone study. And in part, the Sam Stone study said if we, if we characterize the subject of an interview in a negative way, that may prime the child to say negative things about that person. So if we say to the child, listen, you know, you know, Uncle Mike who lives up in the attic is a bad man, and we need to make sure he doesn't touch children like you, so I want to know if he did something to you. You know, Uncle Mike got in trouble for touching kids uh, when he lived in North Carolina, and I just want to make sure you're safe. Now, wait a minute, we're just dumped all over Uncle Mike. We're telling the child that Uncle Mike's bad. We're, we're stereotyping Uncle Mike. And even if nothing happened, or if something happened that was ambiguous or innocent, the child may put a negative spin on it in their mind. They may think if Uncle Mike was simply helping them sit in the computer chair, uh, they may characterize it as he was fondling or touching me when he was putting me in the computer chair because we have declared Uncle Mike to be bad or a molester or something like that. So we want to avoid stereotyping the subject of our inquiry. It'll make more sense when we talk about the Sam Stone study. Other examples of perilous kind of interviewing that um, Wood and Gerben point out include reinforcement. And those are things that we want to avoid when we're interviewing children. We, won't, we don't want to um, reinforce in the form of tangible promised or implied punishment or reward. And we'll learn more about this, and Wooden Bergen point out, this can be as simple as um, praising the child when they make an allegation, you know? And maybe we're interviewing a child and they're telling us about, you know, Uncle Mike was in the attic, and he first came to live with mommy last year, and he works uh, as a mailman, and he's a good guy, we're just going, okay, okay. But one day he put me in a computer chair and he put my he put his hands under my cop and touched my boobies. That's good. Thank you for telling me that, Danielle. Very good. Tell me about what Uncle Mike did. We put, tell me more. Now, we were very neutral with all the other questions. As soon as she mentions the touch of the boobies, all of a sudden we're praising her. So praise is not a bad thing. It's the context of the praise and what you're praising for here, right? So if we're neutral at all other times and we are praising the child when she makes a sexual, sexually abusive statement, uh, that's problematic. That's, that's reinforcement. We don't want to reinforce the child in that way um, and condition her, tell me more, things like that, and I'll, I'll praise you more. I mean, that's the implied message. Uh, we don't want them to have that message. Uh, the maxim, the old uh, 
lesson that in the forensic interviewer field that we offer students like you is we praise effort, not content. Okay? You're doing a good job answering all my questions, Danielle. I want to ask you some more questions. Tell me more about Uncle Mike. Tell me more about this. Um, I know you're trying real hard right, to answer my questions. You're doing a good job. Thank you. You see, I'm praising her effort, not the content of her statements. Now, the other way to do it is, okay, you said Uncle Mike grabbed you on your boobies. Thank you for telling me that. Tell me more about how Uncle Mike grabs your boobies. That's a good job telling me about Uncle Mike sticking his hand down your shirt. No, you don't want to. That's not the message. Praise effort, not content. So reinforced, and we'll learn more about this. This is an overview. These are like, this is the whole class in one article. And the other thing you don't want to do is criticize the child when they answer a question in a way that's inconsistent with what you expected. You know, suggesting that the child's statements are false, inaccurate, or otherwise inadequate. Come on, you must have done more up there. You were in there a long time. You have to tell me what happened up there, Danielle. Well, that would be critical, right? You're, you're telling them that they're inadequate, that, that, that you don't believe them, that, that you're not getting the whole story. That's not an effective or um, best case practice way to speak to a child for a forensic interview. Rewards. We talked last week a little bit about rewards um, for disclosure, tangible rewards. Well, once we're done finding out what Uncle Mike did to you in the attic, then we can go to McDonald's. Okay. So that's, you know, that's, I don't think anybody around here is going to listen. If you make up an allegation against your uncle Mike, I will give you food or money and things. No, I, nobody does that. But, you know, people may say, listen, uh, maybe we can go to McDonald's, but I need to find out exactly what happened with Uncle Mike. Then we can go to McDonald's, okay? And you, the people may think that that's okay, but that, that once you start doing that, you're very close to the line of promising reward for negative statements about Uncle Mike. Limiting the child's mobility. Very similarly, you might say, listen, you can go to the bathroom in a few minutes, Danielle. I just need to know more about what Uncle Mike did to you at the computer chair. Wait a minute, I can't go pee unless I tell you about Uncle Mike? You're going to keep me locked in here until I tell you about Uncle Mike? Okay, what do you want to know? I mean, I'm you know, being a little silly here, but that's, that's, the, that's, that's kind of what we're talking about here. You know, some kid got to go to the bathroom, the interview stops. The child goes to the bathroom. Okay. Now, lots of kids go, I don't want to go home, I want to talk to mom. We're not going to interview stops, but you can't go, well, why don't you tell me what Uncle Mike did, then we can leave. You can say things like, well, listen, I, 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 I want to know everything about, you know, what happened in your house or what you told me earlier, and, and we'll get to go in a little while, Okay. But you got to be careful. We can't just let kids shut down interviews. Uh, and no kid wants to be in there. But we have to be careful about how we express um, ourselves to the children. You know, I just need a little bit more help to find out and make sure you're safe. So I want to talk a little bit more, and then we're going to go see Mommy in a little while. Okay? So you got to be careful with how you structure your response to the child. You don't want them to get the message that it's quid pro quo, which means this for that. If you tell me this, then you can see mommy. You want to avoid, through your questioning and to your commentary to the child, giving them that message. That would be called reinforcement under that section of um, the article. And there are other ways to do it, repeating the question in a way that says, well, he didn't touch you at all when you were in a computer chair? Danielle, when you sat in the computer chair, he didn't put your, his hands on your body anywhere? You know, using a tone like that, using a, um, a, a repeating a question in a way that suggests, I don't like your answer here. <laughs> I'm not buying that here. But let me ask you again, did he touch you in the chair? No, that's a, that's a way to reinforce things. That's a way to, all these things are suggested in bad practice, uh, but they categorize that in the article as reinforcement. Repeating a question that suggests, um, uh, that the child's original response was unsatisfactory or wrong, okay? This is very bad. And you know what? Some clip, when, the, when the clinical interviewers uh, collided with the forensic interviewers, or in the early days of forensic interviewing, you had some of this, which I think has some of its roots from clinical interviewing, where they're not that interested in the real truth, 
but how the child's, you know, what the child's subjective experience was. And you got to be careful with stuff like this, what they call removal from direct experience. Inviting the child to speculate about what might have happened. No, you never want to do that. Okay? You never want them to speculate about what may have happened. And that's why I said earlier, with your interviews with the second graders or seven, six year olds or eight year olds, whatever it is, even if they say, I don't know, I don't know what an affidavit is. Well, what do you think an affidavit is? Okay? We don't do that for any interview. That's, that's this kind of stuff. But well, what do you think it is? Speculate. But for our purposes, I'm not doing a friend's interview there. I want, I want, I want kids to tell us through their um, immature cognitive ability what an affidavit is, so we can learn about how kids process things that they don't know about and how they express themselves when they give answers to things they don't know about. So that when we do forensic interviews, we can be on patrol, paying attention to statements of children um, that might be we might be skeptical of. Um, we learn how kids um, answer questions. Uh, encouraging the child to pretend or engage in a massive play as part of an investigative interview. Using puppets and those kind of things. Listen, they use puppets in clinical therapy. They use clay. They use art. Um, that's why those things are different. We talked about that a little while ago. Clinical interviews and forensic interviews are two different things. Um, you know, and, and there's there's nothing wrong with using them in a clinical interview, um, but they're very problematic in a forensic interview. What about using a, a, a doll to help a child describe what happened to them, like pointing out where, how, Problematic. It, it, it's not. It's provided that the dolls are used accurately. Now, using puppets and clay and art, um, you know, is not per se bad in a clinical interview. Um, there really is no role for those kind of props, those kinds of props, in a forensic interview. But there are very specific props that can be extremely helpful in a forensic interview, and those are anatomical dolls. And we'll talk about them. Uh, they got a bad rap for a while because people weren't using them properly. But when you recognize that there's a process to use anatomical dolls, they can be very powerful tools to helping a child express themselves. But, but, but they're, they're, they have to be used very narrowly, okay? Uh, the, and the interviewer's in control, and they're used to clarify um, things that are ambiguous or, or hard to understand by the interviewer. And without getting into the dolls lecture, you, you'll see why and how we're, not only are we allowed to use the dolls, they are powerful, powerful tools to help children express themselves. Um, but that's far different from what the author is right here, encouraging the child to pretend and engage in imaginative play. That, that's not what we do with the dolls when we do use them. We use them no differently than when we use any prop for any witness. I mean, when, when, if you've ever walked into a civil courtroom where they have many cases for money damages, uh, where the outcome isn't a guy goes to jail, the outcome is somebody's got to pay somebody money damages, many times there are car accident cases. Well. In a civil court, they have a magnetic board that every judge has in their chambers that they bring out because in describing how a car accident occurs, the prop of the magnetic board helps the witness show where the cars were in relationship to the other cars. We let adults use props. Why can't we let children? Well, kids are different. Kids may think that the dolls are toys and to play with. It may encourage children to fantasize. So, yes, dolls are different than the magnetic board that the adults use in the sense that we have to be very controlled and structured in the use of the dolls. They're no different in this aspect, that they are props that help witnesses be clear in what they're saying. Same reason we use the magnetic cars, same reason we use the dolls. But we got to be a little bit more careful with the dolls and children than we do with an adult who's messing with magnetic cars on a, on a, on a board that has a picture of a roadway. Um, 
And, um, you know, physicians come in and they may bring a skeleton. Another thing you see in civil courtrooms is a, is a skeleton sometimes. We have to talk about the bones or whatever, if the bones are relevant to a civil case. I mean, wheel out this, you know, skeleton you might see in the biology class. You know, and the witness might get up and point to where the injury was or what, where they felt pain or something. So props are okay, they have to be used properly. Any other questions about that? Scratching. All right. Actually, I have a question. When it comes to interviewing the children, yeah. um, is there like an age limit for like videotaping an interview, or is it like, you know, all children are, are videotaped when they're interviewed? I just said they have a protection of the, like, the interviewer to make sure that they, you know, like follow the procedures, or does that even depend on the state? Yeah, well, that's a good question, and you're kind of answering some of your questions. Depends on the state. Uh, depends upon um, you know what you're using it for, whether it's a clinical interview or a forensic interview. And in in my county, in Passaic County, um, we we record all kids under 12. Um, most counties do that in New Jersey because there's a rule of evidence that allows the videotapes to be shown to the jury. Uh, it's not the fact that they're videotapes, it's the fact that they are under 12 and they made a statement about abuse. Those kind of statements are called hearsay, but they are admissible in New Jersey because of a special rule for kids. So the, the, the line that the Supreme Court created and the Evidence Commission was 12. So we kind of follow that. We record all kids under 12. And we originally did it because it's, it's a, a lot of work. It's a lot of star. We used to use video cassettes. We had giant closets full of video cassettes. Now you can computers. Storage is not that big of an issue. Um, but after age 12, you don't have as many of the issues that arise with kids that are under 12, and especially kids who are under 7. So we worry about whether the interviewer did the right kind of interview. We also worry about the child's statements um, because when they get older, they may forget what happened or forget the details of what happened. And the video helps us preserve what the kids said exactly as they said it verbatim. So that's real helpful as well. For kids that are over 12, uh, their memories for past events are a little more solid and they're less likely to forget things. Um, not that it would be helpful for all witnesses. Um, but there's no rule that we have to record kids. But for some of the reasons you suggest that we do, and we record them under 12. Um, uh, because, like I said, that's uh, that's where the kids are most vulnerable. The suggestion where they're most vulnerable to um, forgetting and those those kinds of things. Some states record them up to 18. Some states, counties, not New Jersey, don't record them at all. Uh, that would change. Um, but most of the country takes most of them. I was just in Ohio. Hundreds of people do this stuff. I never met anybody who doesn't take. Um, and it's very, very, very helpful. Wouldn't it be beneficial just to make it a rule to, to have all age groups, like a child under the age of 18, just to protect the interviewer as well, that they're not influencing or leading them or the yeah, child? We, you know, oh. listen, you, that's the direction we're moving in with all witnesses. A lot of police departments, um, we put video recorders in all the police departments in 2007 because the Supreme Court wanted us to record all suspect interrogations. The concern there was that we were terrorizing uh, custodial people in custody and they were confessing to things that weren't true. So once the police departments got all these recorders, they didn't have to type statements anymore. You know, take two hours. They just sit in the room and interview the any witness, guy saw a shooting on the corner, or the lady was walking in, the postman got hit by the car, and the driver may have been drunk, uh, saw a fight, oh, okay. They just put everybody on video. Um, so we're kind of moving in that direction. But the thing about up to 18, over 12, all the issues that I just talked about are not that relevant to over 12. It'd be good, I'm not saying it's, it's nice to have, but we're not that worried. You know, when I talk about suggestibility, you'll learn this, but after age 11, uh, kids are no more suggestible than adults, really. Um, you know, uh, number, very few kids over 12 are going to, you know, uh, uh, 
change their testimony because they might get a McDonald's burger or something, uh, or they can't go pee. You know, the, 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 the issues are far more uh, worrisome with kids under 12 than 12 15. And again, with storage, you have to record all this stuff, and then you got to transcribe it, you got to outsource it, or have a secretary sit there and type this off if there's ever a trial. Now the way we do it over 12 is they sit down, we ask questions. So what happened in the attic? Well, you did this because someone's typing it. So there's an instant transcript. But when you make a video, then somebody's got to transcribe it. Like it's expensive, it's tedious. But that's the direction we're moving in. I mean, one day they're just going to record everything. You know, the cops and the interviewers have to be trained better. Not so much the forensic interviewers, but the people who take regular statements about anything from a witness. Because they, they don't stay focused, most of these police officers. They, they start chatting, they digress, they tell anecdotes. I mean, you got a, an hour and a half interview that should have taken 20 minutes. And somebody, that, as, a, as, an av- as an attorney who has to look at this, you know, if you give me a written statement, I can read it in seven minutes. You give me an hour and a half video, I've got to watch it in real time. You took an hour and a half of my day. You know, not that I'm special, but, you know, we only have so much time in the day. If you give me a file and it's an armed robbery and there's seven witnesses' statements and they run an hour to four hours, what am I going to do? Spend the whole weekend, 17 hours in a row watching statements? It's insane. I, I can't watch 17 hours of statements. What else am I going to do? You know, and That's one case. So the answer is to transcribe these things. And that brings another thing. These things cost hundreds of dollars to transcribe. So there's no easy answer. We try to limit the amount of video we produce for some of those reasons. But with under 12, we record them. Um, and you're going to see, you, if you haven't seen some videos already, you'll see videos uh, that we did uh, around the state. Not only in my county, mostly in my county, but there may be others. Any other questions? Okay, let's wrap it up. Um, and um, I'll see you guys here next Tuesday. And you'll see another, another um, section on the Blackboard. Um, Maybe, maybe tonight, probably tomorrow, but it'll be on the left here, and I'll be posting the lecture.